Thank you for being here. It's great to have chili on a 90 degree day. Uh, yeah, but normally in November, you think chili would be a good good deal, but I get into chili any day. But, uh, we thought about moving this outside. We had a, <laughs> and we could, and we may still. But uh, we had a uh, an event yesterday in the West Plains campus, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, uh, groundbreaking, and had it indoors. Uh, we could have had that outdoors, because it was like 110 in uh, West Plains. But... Thank you for being here. Um, before we get started, normally we have uh, President Cliff Smart come up and give, a, give us an update. And uh, he is out of town, but sends his greetings. Uh, but we talked to our, our provost, Dr. John Zizinski. I uh, gave him a good head, five minute heads up. And, uh, and so uh, we'd like to bring that Dr. Dr. John up here and give us a quick update from the university. Well, thank you. Paul, thank you for clapping. Appreciate that. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thanks to those online. Um, lunch with an MSU genius. Looking forward to this one. No pressure, Paul, but really looking forward to your, your comments. Um, on behalf of Cliff, we just thank each and every one of you for your long-term service and being connected as bears. The brief update, kind of maybe four or five quick areas. One you heard about if you were here a couple of months ago, and that is enrollment. Of course, enrollment strong here in the fall of 2023 at Missouri State University. As one example, a 23% growth rate of first time new in college, first time full-time freshmen, essentially from last fall to this fall, 23%. Let me say that again, 23%. You're not. But here's the deal. Here's, here's why it's so important. If you look at our neighbors, our competitors, so on and so forth, not just here, but throughout the country, that by far surpasses almost everyone. I was just with a, a group of higher ed leaders the last couple of days in Chicago, and I mean, heads were down, and we're talking about oh, enrollment rows here in the East Coast or wherever else. And I was like, well, you know, here at Missouri State University, you know. Uh, pretty significant, but part of that enrollment growth is also retention. Those first year students coming back for a undergraduate point of view, it's not good enough just to get them in the door, right? Let's talk about retention. And we uh, we improved our retention rate by about 3%. It's about up to 79%. We think we can get surpass the 80s uh, with some, some, uh, some focused efforts. So enrollment, one piece of the update. A second one is simply connecting this to the community and partnership development. You all probably have read about it, but since maybe we last met or right around the last time we met, Alliance for Healthcare Education, you know, if you think about OTC and Springfield Public Schools, Cox Health, Missouri State University, coming together to do something very, very significant from a partnership point of view, focused on employment workforce, students, faculty, community, and we're just very proud of it. There's a lot of work to do. You know, it's great to announce it, but now it's like, hey, hey, Provost, got to get accredited and do all that. Yeah, there's a lot to do, but we will get it done. When you think about facilities, there's so much going on. If you've been able to walk through campus recently, you know that Dean Tammy Yonke's got some know, cranes out there. And, and Lon what's going on there, Tammy? I'm not even sure what's happening at Lon Hall, but uh, you know, construction is going well there. Construction over uh, both Dean Yonke, Dean, Dean Minor, with regard to Kemper Hall and what we're doing in Denton there. Got some plans for the art annex, and I would say there's significant plans. Of course, the Autism Center that uh, you know, breaking ground yesterday and over in West Plains, and then in E Factory ribbon cutting yesterday in Brick City Three. Tell you what, if you're out for a walk, drive, stop into Brick City Three, third floor. I will tell you that is something that's just simply awesome. We have two new Board of Governor uh, members. We're very pleased to have them. Also, a board member is here today. Our student board member. Bradley, can you stand up and say hello? Okay. And then kind of going into closure here, our last home football game is this weekend. Brent will be 85 or 90, or maybe not, maybe more season-like. Yeah. It's a beautiful day. If you have not seen the marching band, the, the, the halftime show, 
the Beatles tribute halftime show, you know that the Beatles just came out with a new song recently, Artificial Intelligence, but that halftime show is incredible. And the last thing is, uh, several of you have asked, you know, how was the trip to China? And Cliff and Gail, my wife Denise, myself, and a contingent of so many other, we had about a contingent of nine go to China. We were really the, the first group back, frankly, Westerners going back to China. Our partners just with open arms. It was an incredible trip. Um, we had nine flights in 10 days. Each of them were on time, sunny, every single location. We went to the the day before. We'd go somewhere it was sunny. But more importantly, when we walked out with content, with partnership agreements, with kind of a return towards kind of pre-pandemic levels, et cetera. We can get into more details later. But that's a quick snippet of what's going on. There's so much more happening at Missouri State University. I'm sure a big part of it. Thank you. And we're at lunch with the genius today is with Dr. Paul Durham. Um, and he uh, has a fascinating resume. Uh, we're going to talk about epigenetics, uh, rising above your genes. Uh, but he's a, a outstanding researcher, a distinguished professor in biology, the provost fellow for research and work. We're going to talk about diet. We're going to talk about sleep patterns, stress, uh, chronic inflammation, and all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, maybe there'll be some big words in there that uh, I certainly know them, but I'm going to have him explain them uh, just in case. But please welcome our genius, Dr. Paul Durham. Oh, have a seat, and this is very, this, this is a hot seat. Oh, yeah, it, it tr truly is. But thank you for agreeing uh, to be with us. Um, you, you have a really outstanding resume. Um, and he is, I think, our only faculty person that's received uh, the Bronze Bear Award in 2017, the highest award given by, by the university. And so I know we're going to talk a lot about what you're doing now. Did I say it right, epigenetics? Yes. Okay, okay good. Don't know what it is, but I said it right. Um, first of all, tell us, well, wh where were you born? Uh, and we're talking about your family. Yeah, so I was born in Duluth, Illinois. I have, you know, our family had seven of us. There was four brothers and sisters, well, three brothers and one sister. We grew up in an area very rural. Um, the, Closest movie theater, to put it in perspective, was, was 45 minutes away. Um, so we kind of get only about 1,200 people in the hometown. Stayed pretty much this way. Our kids described it as Mayberry RFD. Um, we had like just basically a wooden stop sign in the middle of this town at one point in time. So it's yeah, very, very rural um, background. Um, learned a lot of good values there. So in, in elementary school, I mean, was, were you one of those scientists in elementary school? No, I actually was a slow starter. Uh, I was not like the next student. Um, I probably would be one of those kids that I'd rather be outside than in the classroom. Sorry to say that. Um, no, but when you say no. not the best student, uh, no, we I, have de different definitions of uh, yeah. what a best student. And yeah, so, you don't want my definition. But so, tell, <laughs> so did you? Were you a? You weren't an A student. You were so, a B student. No, yeah, when I first started, actually, um, it was back in the days when I started in the Catholic school system, and they didn't do testing for eyes. So I didn't realize that I really couldn't see. And so I was behind on the game, so to speak. And it was not until third grade that it was actually went out. I was there was I went to the bathroom, I came back and everybody was going out of the classroom. And on the board they had written a note saying, meet us outside. Well, I didn't go outside because I couldn't read the board. And then I got called into the principal's office. <laughs> and they're like, Why are you defiant? Why didn't you go out? And I'm like, I didn't see the note. And then so they finally brought me in. It was kind of crazy, but that kind of happened. Yeah, that was like kind of the precipitating moment when they went, oh, well, wow, I don't know if you could really see what's going on. So I actually started pretty slow. And it wasn't really, I didn't hit the ground until probably junior high, actually, really? where I started actually getting four A's and B's and really catching up. And I had some great teachers, you know, that actually helped me catch up. And so, yeah. so, but I would assume science was your your hot uh, hot subject that you love to do. Yeah, and I was really blessed because my mom was a 
high school biology and um, chemistry teacher. And my dad was like a civil engineer. And so we were outside all the time. So we, you know, we got to do that. And my mom really encouraged me. I mean, I was a little geeky kid. Like, so by the time I hit junior high, yes, I had a microscope, a chemistry set, and all of that. So that's really when it kind of took off for me, was probably junior high. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then and you, you, you went to uh, college, and then went your degrees, uh, your master's, and, and your PhD at the University of Iowa. Yes. So right. tell us about that, uh, how you ended up there. And, yeah, so I ended up, well, I first did my undergrad in the Quad Cities in uh, Davenport, Iowa. And that was actually a really good experience because, again, I didn't start off really great in college. And I like sharing this with my students because when I went off to college, I ended up getting monitored the first year that I was there at Iowa State. And I didn't have, I would say, the support that I needed. And I did not do well. My starting GPA was 2.2. I just survived the first semester. And I like sharing this with my students because that was how I started my academic career. And I never, by the time, when I was in high school, I was getting pretty much straight A's. I was doing really quite well and everything. And I lost my confidence. So when I went home for Christmas, I ended up, it was a really weird sequence for me, not to worry with the details of this, but I ended up having um, basically pneumonia my senior year in high school. Then I went off to college, got mono, and then got pneumonia again. Oh, wow. Again, right after that. So it was, so I literally was told not to go back to school that year because I said, you know, just, I'd lost so much weight and stuff. So what they did is I literally got online and looked for the latest start date in January for any school I could go to. And I found St. Ambrose it was like really late in January. So I'm like, I'm going to go there. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And it was actually changed my course. And I was really fortunate again to have a teacher that kind of took me under their wing. They realized my potential and stuff. And I'll always be grateful to Rich and Marge like that. They, you know, they were really instrumental in me turning a corner. And it, it took that whole semester to get my confidence back. You know, like I four pointed that semester and then it kind of changed the game again and I got my confidence. So whenever I, you know, I like relaying the stories to my own students and stuff, that sometimes it's not like we're always quick out of the gate. Sometimes you just have to stay the course. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. That's a good lesson. Yeah. Actually, I thought you're two point. What did you say? Two point two. No, I, I thought that was very good. I thought, I was very impressed. I thought you were just bragging here. <laughs> very good. I should have said that was on a two-point scale. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you remember Bernie Warren. Well, Bernie Warren had a talk with me after my first semester. Yeah. Yeah. So that could be a whole other program. But um, so so tell me, when you were in college, though, did you say I want to be a researcher, or did you? What was it about science that just really said, "Oh man, this." This is fun. Yeah, the thing that never made sense to my family. So again, growing up in North Central Illinois, about as far away from the oceans as you get, I wanted to be an oceanographer. <laughs> Who inspired me as a kid was Jacques Cousteau. Oh, like I watched every program on Jacques Cousteau. We did paper outs, and my dad kind of didn't understand this one, but back then, I bought the whole entire encyclopedia set of Jacques Cousteau oh, out yeah. of my money, my paper route money and stuff. So I still have the set today. I still have all the books that Jacques Cousteau ever wrote on whales and cetaceans and everything. I've been a nerd in that regard. And that's really what I wanted to do. I really wanted to be an oceanographer. I wanted to study books and travel around the world. When I got into college, I got into my junior year and I sent a, a letter actually to Bruce May, who was actually this really prominent cytologist and stuff, and was studying humpback whales and stuff. And he was at the University of Oregon. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna follow, I'm gonna go that path. I'm gonna go. And he actually wrote back and said and explained how difficult it would be to take that path. And he said, you know, maybe that wouldn't be what you want to do. Just was, because not enough jobs? Or? Well, yeah. I mean, he said he was writing the book just to support his research. And he said it was hard on his family. It's hard on, you know, and he said just that, you know, that. And that kind of made me think about, okay, is this really what I want to do? And you always have to pardon this fun. But my roots were, again, rural. And so when I did, when I went into college and stuff, I actually got a master's in plant biochemistry. So my goal was is to use, this was during the molecular age, like, Right when we were coming into the late 80s and early 90s, we were basically genetically modifying organisms. And so my goal was, is that I really wanted to engineer new plants, like that were more nutritious and things like that. And so I did this whole thing with triparental mating. I did, you know, started that program and stuff. But then somewhere along the line, I just decided that really wasn't quite where my type of thing was, that I was really more still interested in biomedicine oh. and helping people. And I didn't really want to be a doctor, doctor, but I knew that doing biomedical oh. research, I could impact things, you know, and help with drug development, and that's kind of the course they took. Um, so how did you get to uh, to Missouri State then? Uh, 
Luckily, um, well, <laughs> there's a funny story about you. We are basically we were at Iowa, and I, we were, you know, I started applying for jobs, and we literally got out a map, and we said it had to be within eight hours because we're very family oriented. We both have big families. I don't know. I think what we have sixty some first cousins. So we have, wow. yeah, we have a really big family, big rural family. And stuff. So you said eighty. Yeah, yeah we're that's very that's close, but okay. <laughs> got eighty. That's a big thing. <laughs> No, no. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, that was my bad. <laughs> so, we, what we literally did is we got this map out. We said it has to be within eight hours. Well, Springfield was within eight hours of like all the home places and most of our family. And so, we're like, okay, we'll go down there and interview and see what happens. And we came down here and just fell in love with it. Wow. Yeah, so. Well, we're glad that worked out. <laughs> Um, so tell us about your your current research, and uh, you've done all types types of things, mainly health oriented, as you indicated. I know you've done things of like migraine headaches, but but tell us uh, what you're doing now with the epigenetics. Yeah, so my earlier background was literally um, when I was at Iowa, I learned how to grow nerve cells outside the body. So that was really a major thing because then we could look at mechanisms of action. So any of you that suffer from migraine, I'm sorry. For you, but one of the things that we were able to do was in the in our research was show how like Imitrex, topiramate, botulinum toxin, all the CGRP stuff that you see now in migraine, that was my postdoc work. So my postdoc was actually done on CGRP and understanding the mechanism actually. It's now the one, the number one therapeutic worldwide. So it is what everybody's focusing on. Um, so I was really fortunate to have that career path. So we've worked with a lot of pharmaceutical companies. I still have a lot of stuff going on with pharmaceuticals and just initiating more stuff with pharmaceutical companies. But one of the things that I always came back to was the idea that I myself don't use a lot of drugs and I like eating a healthy diet and trying, and that's where epigenetics comes in, right? Is it more about lifestyle choices and such? So one of the things that I wanted to do was actually go back to get back on my roots with the plant biochemistry and actually identify compounds in plants that could actually modulate the nervous system without using drugs. And that's kind of where we currently are. So we're we're using we're trying to identify the compounds in nutraceutical the nutraceutical products, right? Like different plants and things that we can eat that actually can modify our nervous system. But really importantly, what we've discovered, which is a huge paradigm shift, is it's actually if you want to have a healthy brain, you have to have a healthy gut. Yeah. So this is really one of the most probably remarkable things that I have experienced. I have to tell you this story about five years ago or so. I was invited to the American Academy of Neurology Conference, which is the international conference for neurologists. And I was giving a plenary talk there, and I was bringing, I, the talk was on epigenetics and the gut microbiome, and how if we really wanted to change the nervous system of people with neurological diseases, we really had to fix their gut. And we had to figure out ways to do this. And one of the most prominent people that were in the audience actually pooed me. Um, I literally was saying this thing, and he went, I have never been food before. <laughs> so, being going with a bunch of brothers, I started laughing on stage. I don't think it was the reaction that he was hoping for. Um, but I just had a laugh and I said, like, obviously, everybody's not on board with this, but I still think this is going to be the paradigm shift that we're looking at. And that's really what we're seeing now. It's a, yeah. Oh, no. What are we doing here? I'm All right. Uh, so, so tell me uh, the. Uh, uh, the medicines that you take for the various things, I mean, there's still a need for that? Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So what we talk about, and the NIH has this institute, which is called Complementary and Integrative Health. Yeah. So we look at nutraceuticals as being complementary, you know, to it and or alternative therapies. One of the things you have to realize about nutraceuticals is we kind of misuse them in our country. So really what you want to do is take nutraceuticals on a daily basis. And then that helps you maintain the health of your nervous system. <laughs> What we tend to do with nutraceuticals is we tend to say if like this, you know, like you know, eating avocados is good for you, then people started do, overeating them. You see what I'm saying? Uh, and there's this thing called a homoretic um, thing that basically you want to be in the right sweet zone with nutraceuticals. So you want to consume them on a regular basis, but actually too, min too much of it is not really a good thing. So again, if you look at Asian cultures, look at other cultures, that's how you really should be using that. Yeah, you have a Oh, sorry, nutraceutical. So nutraceutical, by definition, is just a compound or a chemical that's found in plants, that's found in nature, basically. So it's not, and the thing that's kind of interesting about this is 
our ancestors right have identified plants. So one of the most remarkable things that I found is that like we study things like dark chocolate, and that's you know used by a lot of people with migraine. I mean, actually, when you go to Spain and stuff, they still use dark chocolate as a way to treat it. Um, what we found is that actually dark chocolate contains beta cytosterol, so it has a steroid type of component in it or a compound, and then that actually can modulate the nervous system and quiet inflammation and pain. So, and then when I, you know, you travel the world and stuff, one of the things I was very fortunate to do when I was out at, in BC, I went to one of the natural history museums and met a, a, a couple that was actually looking at all the ancient medical records and stuff. And what we determined is that at, throughout the globe is that indigenous people had identified plants that contain certain secondary plant products. So compounds that could actually modulate the nervous system and keep you healthy. So they wanted the same plant, right? But what they had is the same chemical. And that's where my, you know, my biochemistry background came into play because I could help link that together for them and say, oh, these are all actually in the same group, basically, because they're all making the same thing, which is all beneficial for us. Yeah. So doctors always tell you, you know, exercise, eat right, uh, get plenty of rest, don't have stress, blah, 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 blah. But it's true, right? Yeah. So eating right, so tell us what... what what, we, what should we eat? I mean, is pecan pie part of that? Yeah. <laughs> Moderation. <laughs> the pecan stick part. Yeah. So, uh, if, if, what do you eat? Well, let's just go with that. I probably eat more like a rural diet. I mean, Debbie's 100% German or mostly German. And so we still, it's like that meat, potato. But we eat a lot of vegetables. Um, yeah. And we have a big, we have a garden. And so we eat a lot of fresh vegetables. We eat a lot of, I Probably seven, eight servings of fruit every day. Oh, so I live pretty much on fruit. Uh, um, what type? What type of fruit? Oh, I, well, I eat an apple every day. Sorry, that's that's, that's good. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I do that, but then I pretty much like cranberries, raisins. I mean, it's just like all that kind of any kind of that kind of stuff. I eat multiple servings of that per day. So, so do you find most people uh, don't? I mean, don't follow that that advice? No. No, I would say that most people, my students definitely don't, because I teach an epigenetics class and I teach a diabetes class, and in those classes, they have to keep a diary uh, of what they eat. Yeah, it's pretty enlightening to them, like how little. So when you talk about diets, I just gave a talk over at Cox North in the nutrition program, and we were talking about like what diets really work. And really, the overwhelming evidence still is the Mediterranean diet, which is highly enriched in you know fruits and vegetables. Um, if you look at the longest-lived people on the planet, the blue zone, as we call it, that's what they follow. You know, they yeah, they basically follow that diet of a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, meats in there, but not as much. But you get a lot of the protein from more like beans and other types of things that you eat. So all these diets, you know, we hear about, I mean, are they is it sort of bogus or is is are there ones that you'd say, yeah, this one like the Mediterranean? I mean, yeah. is there one better than the other in terms of the research. Yeah, the research for cardiovascular disease, for yeah. neurological, all that comes back to Mediterranean diet. Uh, you know, the, you know, it kind of points back to that, not the extreme diets. I mean, there is a ketogenic diet that we do recommend for people with epileptic seizures at times because the sugar is what's causing the problem. So you have to go to fats and proteins. So there are some conditions where you might want to, you know, have a more restricted diet and not be doing that. But the incredible thing about fruits and vegetables is that you get all your minerals and vitamins from that. Um, from the vegetables and stuff, but what you get from the fruit is again you get nutrition from that, and but what you really get is a lot of antioxidant potential. So like you've probably heard of resveratrol, you know, and the seed. That's not only just in grapes and stuff; that's in a lot of things. But probably one of the most surprising things that we did um, was we started a project with Mandy Herbster. She's a master's student. Um, she got her PhD at the University of Washington now in plant sciences. But she was a. It was fun because we were looking at the grapes, um, you know, the Norton grapes, which are local, you know, in this area and stuff. And what we did is we basically fractionated it. So we looked at the skin, because that was what everybody said was the most important part. We looked at the pulpy part, and then we looked at the seed, which was kind of the throwaway part of everything. And what we found is by far and away, the most nutritional part of this grape was the seed, which we were throwing away. Um, and then what we did is we fractionated that, we looked at what's in it, and basically, um, Sophia is here, basically has continued that research, and she's actually shown that it, it modulates the GABAergic system, which is actually our natural way to blocking pain and suppressing pain and inflammation. So she, you know, taken that from where we started to this, you know, culmination of really understanding how important that really is. So when we're talking about stress, 
most of you know the term fight and flight response. Well, when we talk about that, that's basically talking about your sympathetic system. So that's driving, and what we, call it, what we talk about is allostatic load, that that's putting things in your bucket that are driving up your stress, causing you to have more inflammation, <clears throat> disrupts your sleep. As crazy as it sounds, all that stuff is related, right? Because you know this yourself. If you're sleep deprived, you're stressed, you don't make good food choices. You yeah. tend to eat foods that are higher in calories, higher fat. And again, that's where the exercise comes in. So I'm trying to get the exercise component in there. So when you exercise, your brain just naturally gravitates to eating more healthy. You know, And part of it is, again, the, the advantage of the fruit and vegetable diet is, is it tells your brain to shut off. So we have these you know, basically hormones that get released by our gut that go to our brain. So when you eat plant-based type of stuff like that, all that fiber, so again, that's um, important because that fiber signals to your brain that you've got what you need. You don't need to keep eating. The other really important component of the fiber is we don't use it, but the gut bacteria do. So we have to maintain a healthy lawn down there. And so one of the things that we, that's kind of, you know, I always use the pun, it's sad. Our diet is so bad right now. We used to be called the Western diet to compare us to other things. Now we're just called sad. And it stands for standard American diet. Like my West, my European colleagues don't even want us in their camp anymore. They're like, no, no, you guys have gone so far that no. So it's yeah, literally called a sad diet. And we know that there's like, again, we don't maintain a healthy microbiome with that. So we're really promoting inflammation and other types of things when we don't have the high fiber and stuff in our diet. It's very yeah. depressing. All right. Um, okay, I mean, you can put a so so this research then, and I know you 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 review journals. I mean, you you're uh, you're all over the world in terms of, of that. But what 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 do you do with the research then? It, you and and how does it get more implemented? Yeah, so we, we well, I give a lot of talks. I have a couple of talks coming up this month and stuff. <clears throat> One of the fun things that I actually started during COVID was we have this oral facial pain group that involves five continents. And so we get together on every, the first Thursday, was well, Friday in Sydney, Australia, because that's where the space is. But we all get together on the first, that first Thursday night. And then we talk about this and we talk about how we can implement it. And the thing that's, again, not being, you know, negative about this, but in other cultures where they have more socialized medicine, it's easier to send this message. Like they embrace it better. Um, Americans, we're still kind of more pill oriented. We want to know like how we can fix it with that. But really what it is, is going to like the American Headache Society. I mean, I have, I actually, well, I'm not bragging. I just got a really nice recognition and an award for that next week that I'm going to be going there and talking about some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, and it's really kind of cool because then I can go out and talk to people that are in the migraine space, right? and give them the hard evidence they need to go to their patients saying, look, this is how it works. Because that's really what it is, right? So like for drugs, we go due diligence and we show you exactly how the drug is working. That's kind of where we are in the nutrition space now and in the nutraceutical space. We have, it's on us as scientists to actually show you why you should eat this. And then if we provide you the evidence, then you know, patients believe it more, right? So I think that's kind of where we're at in the field. So I'm actually very optimistic that like as we move and we round the corner, I was just on a, a Lundvik advisory board. I, get it, so I didn't make this title up. It's called Meeting of the Minds. It was an international group that got together to talk about migraine. And they're even opening up their, their mind to think about like combination therapies. So the NIH grant that I have out right now is doing just that. It's trying to bridge basically taking a pharmaceutical, which has a lot of side effects. But if we combine a nutraceutical with that, we can lower the amount of that pharmaceutical. So now you don't have the negative side effects. So that's kind of my end goal with all this is actually the combination. So it's not getting rid of the pharmaceuticals, but it's actually doing complementary type of stuff where you know the same pathways are being activated, but then you can lower the dose of that drug so that it's still very selective about what it's done, but you don't have the side effects. Are the pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical companies working with you or are they mm -hmm. are they the enemy? Uh, uh, well, not most of them. Most okay. of them, I think, are turning the corner on this. They're okay. understanding the value of this because okay. this is what patients want. Okay. You know, so yeah. So, so what's next in the research? Well, we're still doing work on the nutraceutical um, domains and stuff. Um, basically, that's still a high priority because one of the things that NIH is asking us to do is, of course, fractionate it. Kind of like what we did with cocoa and stuff like that is the dark chocolate is actually getting it down to the molecules. The thing that I'm really excited about is that we just, we've applied for some, uh, last year we got a, a new um, um, instrument to basically fractionate the samples. 
And then we're also applying for a grant this year to get something that can analyze those. But if we have those pieces of equipment, then we can actually go down to the molecular level and identify the molecules that are active. The really cool part about this is what I really want to do with this project is identify the ones that can cross the blood-brain barrier and work centrally versus ones that work peripherally. And so this has actually really huge implications because Sophia's work showed that basically it's modulating the gaba system. But what if, if we can actually use the grape seed extract and actually make a fraction that we know goes specifically into the brain to basically, you know, hit these targets and stuff, that would be really revolutionary. That would be really important, I think, um, to develop that. And so when you talk, and I, I know you, I've heard some other talks that you've had talking about chocolate. <laughs> um, of course, that's yeah. <laughs> Everybody likes dark chocolate. So, so what dark chocolate? Now it is dark chocolate. Yeah. So, what do you what dark chocolate brand or what do you mean Reese's? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Hershey's. Actually, believe it or not, we did this with um Chon Askinosi. Oh, okay. so we actually use Askinosi's chocolate um in this in their cocoa powder, and we've been. We actually been studying that for over 10 years and it's incredibly consistent. Um, That's the stuff. Too. That was the stuff that we actually studied and showed that it was very, very effective in our migraine models and our TMD models. Any kind of pain model we brought into it was very effective. So where does wine come into this? That's after you eat the chocolate. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, the, the wine comes in because of the, the skin, you know, the, the, what they make it out of, the resveratrol. So there are secondary plant products. There's products in that that are actually, we know are very beneficial. And we know that they can, again, go into the brain and they help suppress inflammation. And actually, a lot of things that we're learning with grape seed extract is it actually targets receptors that help you with anxiety. Oh. So one of the things that I've really been trying to get to somebody to do is to do a study where we actually give GSC to animals when we're transporting them. Oh. Because when we were, I think it was in Australia, right? That we actually learned that when in Australia, they actually incorporate GSC in the feed of the animals that they're shipping to Asia. And they found that that was an anti-anxiety type of thing, that they didn't lose as much weight. They actually were much healthier once they arrived and stuff. So we know that, you know, so like I said, through Sophia's work, that it modulates the gabinergic system, which is tied into anxiety. So, like, so again, if you have a stressful life and such, which a lot of people do, eating these kind of compounds and stuff or incorporating them into your diet actually helps suppress that, you know, so it's working, you know, through your normal pathways. Yeah. So this, this research is just fascinating. You're, but, and, and we're so proud you're here. You could do this research <laughs> anywhere, right? So uh, I feel very blessed here. Let me put it that way. I, yeah. yeah. And tell us about, so where you work, I mean, your, your physical surroundings, and the importance of having students. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of, of having JVIC on our campus, wherever yep. we can have students actually involved in this thing, get an experience. We're going to meet one here in a little bit. But tell us, uh, I mean, you could, you could do this research all over the world. Yeah, yeah, you're here. It's like that. But I mean, Jamie is a really unique place. I always have to send kudos out to Alan and stuff, you know, because it's it really has been, I don't know if I would have been able to do that in a different facility because of just how complex our research is and the number of new rooms that we need and things like that, um, because it does go across so many different disciplines. But honestly, the thing that was kind of funny, and I always don't really know if I should share this or not, but when I left Iowa and stuff, which is an R1 institution, um, I was told that I was committing academic suicide. Because um, the arrogance was is that there's no way you can go to a teaching school and actually be successful there. And the thing that I always thought is that, I don't know, we have students, right? And <laughs> yeah. That's all I can do. So it's kind of crazy to think about is that we've done all this without, you know, like I said, we've done it with our homegrown students. So over 90% of, of everyone that I've had working in my lab is even full-time employees have all been homegrown. They've all been students that we've had. So I'm very, very proud of the fact that when I had NIH funding like I have coming up now, we will be the only institution that is involved in this new big initiative at NIH that actually does not have a PhD program, is not associated with a dental school or medical school. Wow. So it's really kudos to our students, right? Because again, I wouldn't be sitting here and then some of the pictures that I have obviously acknowledge that. So I'm always... I end every talk that I give um, at international meetings with a picture of our, I, I always start it with a picture of JVIC and the opportunity that I have being in such a great facility. 
and at this university, but then also end it with my students, you know, because I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, that's that's yeah. You have won lots of awards, uh, lots of accolades uh, all over the country. The list is, is quite large. Can, can you point to one that you say, man, I'm, I'm most proud of that one? Hmm. Or maybe that may be a hard question. Well, the, the one that actually I'm just it's like again not self-promoting here, but next week I get um, being recognized for oral facial pain. So the American Headache Society, which is the international group for migraine and headache and such, um, yeah. So I'm winning. I wouldn't say it was a lifetime award, but it's basically being recognized for being an expert in oral facial pain and bridging that. And I think that's really pretty cool that your colleagues actually selected me for that. Um, you know, because it is an international type of group. Um, but it really oh, thank you. no, 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 no. Why don't I? But it's really, but it's, to me, it's an opportunity. So I get, a, I get to give a lecture out there, and again, it's just, it's about education, right? But it's fun that they actually recognize the importance of that, you know, and that the work that we're doing in the nutraceutical realms and stuff like that. So I think for me, seeing the paradigm shifts like that, that's actually really rewarding because I think we're going to be able to reach more patients that way. Yeah. And honors yeah. Missouri State as well, yeah. uh, which is it's great for us. We do have some photos. You talked about the photos and. and as we do in this segment, we we show a little family photos, um, and I think Angie's getting those together. Uh, I, saw, I saw them earlier, and then we made who and all on the first one. Um, so, uh, how how old were were you here? That was around first grade, I think. Yeah, something like that. Uh, yep. Next one. Oh, we got the glass. What, when, when did you start wearing glasses? Third grade. Third grade. So my wife yeah. and I always share the story that when we got our glasses, we didn't realize there was telephone wires. So we just knew there was poles. We didn't even know that there was wires on those poles. That's how bad our vision was when we started off. Um, the really sad part about this, and you can see that I'm not really smiling, um, that's because my brother and I got into a, a dispute. We used to save chairs during commercials. Do you ever used to do that? Um, so we would save a chair, and then we got in an argument over who saved the chair first, and he pushed me, and unfortunately, my tooth broke off and the thing, so I ended up with a silver cap on my front too. So for too many years I did not smile. <laughs> so I'm just like, okay, this it was a really tough time growing up with in the early 70s. So I was born in 62, but growing up in the early 70s, my dad believed in haircuts and I had black, those wonderful black glasses, and I had a silver tooth. I to say that I was picked on yeah, a little bit. Uh, it was kind of rough at times, you know, just kind of yeah. but anyway, made it through that. I have a look at you now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Pretty cool there. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's late 70s there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. kind of yeah. glad that moved on from there. <laughs> Is that a leisure suit? <laughs> I can't believe my wife actually was okay with yeah. And so she actually went ahead and married me after. So oh, I was like, oh boy. No, okay. those wings at college. Oh, you know, Debbie. Well, Debbie would embarrass me even more and say that I actually had like those, what were they called? Those, the heels? Like the, when they remember that when they were platforms. like platforms? Oh, yeah. Oh, I had the whole bad look going on. <laughs> yeah. You were cool back then. Uh, that's for sure. Okay. It was <laughs> Chad. Yeah, this is one of the first ones over when I first came in 2001 here and working in that lab. And, I have to thank MSU because when I came here, we didn't really have a lab space. So they had to divide, you know, make an actual lab space for me. And that's where we started, it was in that room right there. And that's in? That's in Temp uh, well, Blunt Hall now. Blunt Hall, yeah. yeah. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, those are just some earlier pictures of, like, you know, the again, being in the lab and stuff like that. So I always just like thinking about, like, how, again, how fortunate I've been here. And then again, we've had so many. Um, I think it's now over 120 students that I've mentored for undergrad and somewhere around 45 for graduate, you know, so that's okay. wonderful. And this again is, you know, the team over at JVIC and stuff. So this was actually a really critical point in my career and stuff with, you know, Matt and Rishi and all those guys and um, the two in um, thing, Brian, Katie on the one side and, and Jordan, and that was a really fun time period because we were um, really launching all the nutraceutical stuff and getting it all up and running. So yeah, that was a fun time. And this, I've been very blessed, again, being able to talk internationally and go, I have a lot of um, really good friends in Sydney, um, which is really fun. 
Um, that was the, you can see the Kiwi in the background. Yeah. That was actually when there was a bad incident. There was a, someone killed over in New Zealand and we were there that night and we had a moment of silence. The whole, that sound in the harbor of Sydney and they lit up the opera house for that. And so, but like I said, I've been very blessed to, you know, be able to go and share our research and stuff. How often do you travel the world? Uh, how many trips in a year? Um, well, I mean, at the heyday of it, it was probably about 11 or 12. Oh, wow. And that, that was a little tough on her family. It's more like about six or seven now. <laughs> that's, that's a lot still. Got a bunch of pictures here. Groups. Yeah, and this is just showing kind of a potpourri of the, the groups and stuff. And like I said, I always like ending with students and stuff because they are why I'm here. So I can have the ideas, but they're the ones that do the work and they're the ones that carry it out and such. So, um, yeah, so I wouldn't, like I said, I'm always... Even on the talk next week, I literally will emphasize the fact again that this is all done with, you know, bachelor's and master's level students. We don't have a, I mean, a lot of R1 institutions, of course, they're using postdocs and like they have a lot of other resources and stuff as far as that. But I mean, bottom line is, is we're able to do really good science here with our students because we have such a great population of students. So, yeah, so. And you've got some great success stories from those students. Uh, oh, yeah. That are doing, and we'll meet one here, but actually, she's not a student anymore, but uh, sort of. But anyway, okay, more pictures here. Oh, yeah. So, our family, um, we're all kind of like science nerds, really, but we also are very musically oriented, which is something people might not know about us. Um, Debbie's our music director at our church, and we actually met um, in a science lab. So we were both, she was, I was actually, had already graduated. I was working in a lab and Debbie came in and I remember my job, I'll probably drop. You know that thing that I just went, oh, I get to work with her, great. Um, I was a full-time, I was a full-time scientist and she was coming in as a senior working on a project. And we actually didn't date right away. We just became really good friends and such. And then we both realized that we were, we love rural areas. We, we both knew what we kind of wanted out of life and stuff. And then it kind of just progressed from there. Um, and it's, so we've always loved nature. And so uh, one of the things we did during the COVID time is we took up biking in a big time way. So we did all the trails around here and stuff. That's been something that's been really fun. Um, and then I just love the Ozarks because there's just so many things to do here. Um, and then our family, you can see that, yeah, there was, um, most of them were up there. We had the three boys and then we have our daughter who's on far left up there in that picture in the green grass. And then we're blessed with uh, two um, daughter-in-laws, uh, Lauren's in the white, and then Courtney's over there on the, um, the or, yeah, on the right, and then um, Courtney's over there on, next to Zach on the right as well. So yeah. Yeah. Well, you can see that I'm much shorter than all of my kids. Oh yeah, and then we're really blessed now. We have two grandchildren, um, two grandsons. Um, this is little Elliot. Uh, we have another one that's due anytime this week. Oh, uh, so we will good. be like Congrats. probably three times over by the end of this week if at all. Uh, yeah, goes well and stuff. Right. Yeah. Now we go to the, the lightning round. So whatever pops in your mind, answer. Uh, <laughs> and then then uh, we'll bring some folks up. Uh, favorite hobby? Probably doing tai chi. Ah, yeah, she. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I've been in martial arts for I started in martial arts a long time ago and taught Aikido for a number of years and such, and then moved into Tai Chi and pretty much that's what I do every day. So I really like every Tai day. Chi. I like pretty much. Yeah, I'm pretty religious about my Tai Chi. I anchor myself with that. Yep. Help stress. Oh yeah. Yep. I don't know, Debbie. <laughs> you better do some this afternoon. Yeah. yeah right. Good movie or a good academic lecture? Hmm. A good movie. Um, I I like Gattaca. I mean, it's a, it's kind of funny. It's a it's a movie that for me was our generation. It was like I was a molecular biologist at the time. And it was just so much fun. I actually got to go to the, I always say the word wrong, but yeah, yeah. over here. Yeah. And we did an actual presentation one time that was really fun. I got to actually watch the movie and then do a dialogue, you know, stop the movie. And we actually discussed it because it was, and that was really fun to like actually explain it at the time, what we were seeing. Because if you don't know the premise of the movie, it's basically where we are today is we have all this molecular ability. So we can actually do a, a stick on a baby and pretty much, do their whole entire genome, right? And know what diseases that they're going to be predisposed to. Um, and that's really, to me, was pretty exciting. Is that, you know, that, that movie when it came out, like, well, this is the future. This is where, and that is where actually where we are today. We could we can actually analyze that kind of, at that level. So, so yeah. Uh, are you a winter person or a summer person? 
Paul. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, down here in the Ozarks, I just love it. I mean, I love the fall and the springs here. Um, summers get a little bit warm. Debbie's smiling because last summer was really painful for me, literally. Um, we had swarms of wasps. And I went through multiple rounds of literally having whole swarms of wasps come and sting me. And I was terrified to go in my own backyard. Real sad, it? <laughs> so I'm kind of grateful that, that we're past that. Um, yeah. So if you weren't a researcher, yeah. what what occupation would you be doing there? If I wasn't a researcher, I'd probably just be a full-time teacher. I would actually, I think I could see myself doing that. I would love to just, you know, be in the classroom and share you know, so that I think that would probably be what I would want to do. Sports or performing arts? Which one? Oh, what? I had sports. Debbie was laughing. She's not too good looking at me. Like sports, definitely. But we do like the performing arts. That was part of our discussion when we were, you know, before we were dating and stuff. We were like, yeah, we both were like, let's go outside and get dirty in the garden and stuff. But then we could dress up and go to a, a concert that night and stuff. Like, that's kind of our mentality. This is an easy one, probably. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Early morning person or a late night owl? I am more the morning person in our family. Ah, how early? How early you get up? Oh, like now it's like around six, six thirty. Yeah, so that's good. Are you a planner or more spontaneous? Oh, I'm more of a planner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, fiction books or nonfiction books? Fiction, because I think sometimes I just need a break. You know, yeah. from all the mental stuff, and it's just kind of fun to read about. And I like the part of the arts and stuff where it makes me. I like reading books that are actually, project, you know, like futuristic. Oh, yeah. because a lot of times you can get ideas from those, yeah. about, like you know, and stuff. So I, I kind of enjoy those. Yeah, it's in a different place. Thank you. See, that wasn't so bad. Uh, Sophia, we're going to bring you up. Uh, so Sophia Antonopoulos. I hope I got that correct. You did. Um, she is an honor student, and I'm going to have you hold this. Uh, she worked in the lab, uh, got her bachelor's and master's. She's actually working in the lab now, right? Yep. Uh, a top researcher. So tell me your your story and how you became a client. Yeah. So. And where are you from? I'm from Stockton, Missouri. Okay. So if you're from Stockton Lake, you know where I'm from. Um, in high school, I was touring different colleges, trying to figure out where I wanted to go. I actually wasn't going to come to MSU. But I was doing a scholarship interview, and the person interviewing me happened to be Dr. Mathis, the department head of the biology department. And at the end, she asked me what kind of research I wanted to do. And I said, well, I don't know, but the opioid epidemic um, is very interesting to me. I would love to do research um, investigating alternatives for pharmaceuticals. And, um, well, the interview was over. We ran out of time. Dr. Mathis and I were actually in line in the bathroom. She pulled out a napkin and said, here's Dr. Durham, email. I think you should email him and get in contact with this guy. I lost the napkin, but I found it. I found it two weeks later. And thank goodness I did, because I emailed Dr. Durham. And this was all the summer before my freshman year at MS here. Um, and he, he invited me in for a tour, um, an informal interview. And then I started working at the lab the week before I started classes in my <clears throat> freshman year. So how big of a deal was it? Did you realize what you had there? Oh my gosh, no, considering I lost the napkin. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, I mean, I thought, yeah, I need to contact with this guy, but I had no idea it was going to lead to a job for five years, um, publications, research, the whole nine years. And you've, you've already been published in journals. I on have. your research, yes, and and and, uh, and tell us more about the research that, that you're doing. You're the same. You're working with Dr. Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, same sort of research. Um, my thesis project in particular was looking at the grapeseed extract that he's talked about in those nerve cells that we can grow outside of the body. And then my project is, I believe, the first one that figured out that grapeseed extract increases. Um, GABA activity, which is um, kind of an anti-anxiety, anti-pain neurotransmitter. So. And so how, how have you applied all this to you in terms of your, you know, what you eat, what you do? Oh, yeah. I've, I've totally changed my life throughout my course in college. I'm sure everybody does. At my freshman year, get that freshman 15, go to the dining halls all the time, kind of ate like garbage. <laughs> and then 
learned more about epigenetics, took Dr. Durham's epigenetics class, um, his diabetes class, and thought, you know, I'm studying this stuff. I should probably apply it to my own life. So um, started eating better, exercising. Um, I really don't take pharmaceuticals unless I have to. I like to reach for the grapeseed extract or go on a walk. And I rely a lot more on those um, natural supplements on a daily basis. And I'm a lot healthier now. To having great professors, um, and we've said this everywhere we go, when we do alumni events, I mean, people talk about the person who changed your life. And they're all professors, more than likely, because mm -hmm. they take an interest. Tell us what you want to do uh, after after you this lab. I mean, what, what's your what's your really long time goals? You know, if you had asked me a few years ago, I probably had some specific topic I wanted to study. But now I'd say it's a lot more broad. Um, I've gotten to work on a lot of different projects, and I figured out that I just love research. I just want to do research to help people. That sounds cheesy, but I just want to be able to help people and enjoy what I do. So I think I'll go anywhere that that takes me. Very good. And and. Um, you go to conferences around the world as well, country, do you present as well? Yeah, I've presented, um, I've presented quite a bit as a student. We do a lot of poster presentations for all of our undergraduate students. Um, and then not internationally yet, but I got to go to a conference in San Diego last year and present our research there. And it's so much fun to explain research to other scientists. <laughs> and did you want to do that in the beginning? And when you were little little girls, you say, oh, this is what I want to do? For the most part, yeah. Oh. Ever since in middle school, I wanted to be a physicist. And then in high school, did not like physics at all. And I said, you know, probably biology. I started out as a double major with biology and chemistry. Um, and I realized I just love biology, but I pretty much always wanted to be a scientist. Yeah, we're proud of you as well. Uh, we, I know there's got to be questions out there. I got a million questions just about my personal health, but we're working on here. Yes. I have a personal question. Where do you get this grapeseed extract? My wife is seven inches shorter than she is. She has severe osteoporosis, and it sounds like it might help her. Where do you get it? Grapeseed extract. I'm stupid, but what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're actually using Healthy Origins. It's the kind that we're using, and it's like um, it comes in 300 milligram tablets, and it's oh. been very, very consistent for. We've been studying it for what over 12 years now, and it we measure like the antioxidant, the Cox potential, and everything it stays very, very consistent. So it's actually made from the throwaway grape seeds from the California grapes industry. Um, the University of San Diego is the one who kind of came up with the process and everything and it's but yeah that's what i would say is yeah and then you can get it on amazon um healthy origins and such and then one brief comment that i found absolutely amazing i heard on the radio one day that 80 percent 85 percent of the vegetables americans eat is french fries Oh yeah, it's. Do you think it's, that's an accurate yeah. statement? Um, 85 percent. Yes. Yeah, it is. Well, it's it's but it's not just french fries; it's potato chips. As well, well, yeah. So by far and away, potato is our. So as far as it sounds, all the other vegetables. Right. Yeah. No. We when we talk about vegetables, that's yeah. the one vegetable. So when we say we eat a vegetable, it's potatoes. But then the bad part, the thing I just taught in my honors class is actually it's the skin of the potato that actually contains all the nutrients and such. Yeah, like and so often we get rid of that. It's the inner side is just starch, right? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I used to recommend grapeseed oil for my patients. You know, when they ask for yeah. healthy oil, mm -hmm. is that equivalent or close to the grapeseed extract? See, that's what we're trying to get at because the oil component, like you know, is different than the grapes. So the grapeseed extract that I'm talking about is actually with high pressure and heat and less water extract. So it's going to have some of your oils, but not be enriched in those. So we think that there's actually different components, and that's what we're trying to figure out is what those components are doing. Um, and so they serve maybe different purposes. But like the grapeseed extract that we're using is you can take it orally. That's the kind of advantage of that. Yes. Okay. First off, thank you very much for this presentation. It's been very enlightening. Um, one question that I know both my husband and I have dealt with when actually visiting with your family physician or being specialist, a lot of times when you ask, well, what about this? What do you know about grapeseed? They kind of poo-poo it. Is there an effort to 
get that to cross over to the you know western medicine side some of the nutraceuticals yeah that's what we're pushing so it's actually i'm again kind of fortunate that actually we're doing a special issue for for the headache community it's the american headache society is sponsoring this through the journal and stuff but i've invited to write a review article he is an author on that as well to actually talk about this so one of the ways that we can do is disseminate information. We have to help clinicians understand the value of it, that literally they contain products that look and act just like our drugs do, but they're at safer levels and such. And then again, the idea is, is put them into your diet on a regular basis, right? Um, so yes, we're definitely moving that way. I'm very encouraged that like, again, the, this is the first time that really they've actually had a special issue just on alternative medicines and alternative therapies for treating migraine and stuff. So I think there's a paradigm shift is happening. Um, but like, again, it takes a while for people to get out of their comfort zone. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, the product that you see advertised on television, right? one chart for vegetables and one for nature, something or other, the very colorful one. I know you've yeah. seen it now. I can't think of the name of it. Take one for vegetables, one for fruit. You have all you need. What do you think of those? No, I'm not a big fan. So one of the things that even like with probiotics is versus a prebiotic. So a probiotic is something that you take that has live strains of bacteria in it. Um, we have over 2,000 bacteria in our gut, and they're only giving you a handful of them. So th they might be somewhat beneficial, but the better way to do it is actually to do a prebiotic, which is what the fruits and vegetables yeah, are. That's not bad, but I don't no. see how they get away from advertising like that. This is one of the problems that we have with the, the whole industry is that they really, so what they can say is that it promotes health. They can't actually claim that it actually treats yeah. anything. And that's the, how they get around this. Yeah. But again, it's the problem with, again, just marketing is that the problem with, you know, we have is that there are products out there that are really are not valuable. So then it's really hard for physicians to know like, okay, what's valid and what's not. That's why like for us, we, whenever I get talks and stuff, I like saying that we look at healthy origin and we've looked at Askinosis chocolate because we know what's in that. And we know what you're getting because their product has stayed the same for over a decade. Um, or a lot of these other ones, it's like, it's, yeah, you don't know, but yeah, what they're claiming is not true. So you're saying prebiotic is what you should be doing. Yeah, because a prebiotic is feeding the bacteria, right? So it's actually helping maintain all of those 2,000 bacteria that you have in your gut. So the more diverse the diet, the more diverse the bacteria that are there. Yeah. Yes. First of all, uh, congratulations for all your accomplishments. Oh. Um, to a student like Sophia. <laughs> absolutely. It was different that make us better. Um, but my question to you is, um, you know, there are two views about the epigenetics, uh, whether it is inheritable or not. Uh, because, you know, after all, it's not the directly the genes are affected in an indirect manner in the mechanism, mm -hmm. being the epigenetic genes, uh, either acetylation or methylation, no, methylation or something like that. So my question is, uh, what is your... Um, studies or your research or your own views on whether they are heritable or non-heritable um, from one generation to the other. Question. Yeah. Effect of APGs. So the question is, and this is actually a really important one. So what we used to think when I was going to school is that like the sperm and the egg when they were formed, that the slate was wiped clean, that you would have access to all 20,000 genes that we have. And so you had to start with this clean slate. What we recognize now is that's not the case. And who really influenced you? This is going to have to be sitting here to think through this one. So where you came from was the eggs for your mother, right? So you came from your mother, but your mother's eggs were developed when she was inside of your mom, her mother. So you were actually, your eggs that gave rise to you were actually first formed inside of your grandmother. And your grandmother had the ability to imprint on your genome. So what your grandmother was experiencing in that time, if she was like... For example, um, is being starved because of World War I, this is how this was actually discovered, that actually set up their metabolism differently because they were living on 600 calories a day. And so what it did is it imprinted. So from a biological point of view, it's really incredible that not only do we inherit our DNA, the genes, right, but we also in, get this imprint of what your grandmother was thinking about the environment, how it was influencing her, and it sets up our genome, you know, what genes are going to be active when you're born. So again, if you think about that, it's really protective from, an, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, that the grandmother kind of influences that and knows kind of what's happening. Um, and that actually carries on, you know, yeah. so that will be passed. The Irish famine in I Ireland. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's an indication that that's, mm -hmm. that's what they say. But I was just wondering whether it is still valid that 
argument. I don't know. You, uh, you know, I don't know whether in the modern society, so, you know, whether that oh, diet, the diet, dietary effect, you know, yeah. is transmissible mm -hmm. into the next but, generation. But like you said, it definitely is. This again, I was saying to go to the dark side with these things, but yeah. it's kind of where the reality is right now for us. One of the things that scares us as a scientist is that we that whole epigenetics that we're talking about. So if you have a, a, some, a mother right now who's pre-diabetic or obese, they've already going to imprint that genome onto their offspring. And not only their offspring, but it goes for four generations. So we know that we're headed for kind of this period. Now, the, the silver lining in all this is epigenetics trumps genes. So, so you can't change the genes you get. But epigenetics, your lifestyle, you know, the diet, sleep, and stuff like that can change, like you said, the patterns of expression of those genes. So you can turn off bad genes. So even though you have a predisposition toward cardiovascular disease or diabetes, if you do the right things, you can basically shut those genes off. And that's, I think, the power of epigenetics. And that's the message we're trying to get across the physicians. So I'm always very upbeat. I didn't sound maybe as much upbeat today. But I'm always very um, optimistic. I mean, that's how I try to spin it. Is like I'm like this is really cool because epigenetics is dynamic and you can change your epigenome and you can change the expression of your genes to promote your health and shut off bad genes that cause disease and such. Wow. Yeah. I know we 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 got one more one more question. Uh, Let him go. All right, you go quick with this. Yeah. 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 Go quick. Um, in your oral facial um, exam, mm -hmm. does that include? Uh, Right, yes, so we look at TMD, so temporal mandibular joint disorder, which is almost as prevalent as migraine, and then trigeminal neuralgia as well. So I was really fortunate that we got to go to Ireland, got an invited talk to actually go to a world symposium on trigeminal neuralgia and present in Dublin, Ireland. Um, it was really cool. They lit up all the buildings with green um, in awareness of this and stuff. So I've been part of that. I wish I could say there was more. I think what we um, have just given a lecture on this just more recently to the oral facial pain group in Australia and stuff. And we're, we are looking at nutraceuticals because that's one of the things of, that we can get at to help with trigeminal neuralgia. So I'm very I'm optimistic. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. I know we're out of time in, and I don't know if you have time afterwards if yeah, people want to visit, but uh, we're very proud of you, uh, Dr. Durham, and you. what you're doing. Sophia, we're proud of you. And uh, we know you will do great things, continue to do great things. And, and we're so glad you all are Missouri State Bears. We appreciate appreciate you. Now, after this, we all are going to go on a 10-mile walk. <laughs> Come back and eat some uh, grapes uh, extract and then uh, some chocolate uh, for that. Uh, we will be back on January 22nd. Uh, Judith Martinez uh, will be here as our genius finding community with adversity. So thank you for being here. Go Bears. <laughs> and